Alright guys, we are going to get the operations committee meeting started. Um, I think for the Perfect, so for the record, Director Finch is joining us uh, by phone. Uh, and our first item of business is to approve the minutes of the April 11th Operations Committee meeting, uh, which were attached on board docs. Is there a motion? I move that we approve the minutes of April 11th. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Great. And then that brings us to uh, item C, which is our attendance support busing presentation. And I will turn it over to Madam Chase. All right, thanks everybody, good evening. Um, attendance support busing is what we wanted to come and spend some time talking to you about tonight. You remember when we worked through the budget reduction process, we did have attendance support busing listed there for a while, but we ultimately factored that out, knowing that it uh, doesn't really align with our values um, around um, some of the decisions we've made in the past about providing this attendance support busing, but we also realize we have a limited funding uh, ability to do this, knowing once we go beyond the mandated uh, walk zone routes that we do need to provide transportation for. Uh, we don't have an endless amount of resources to do attendant support busing. So um, I know the team's going to spend some time talking to you about uh, items or criteria that we've used in the past to try to identify attendant support routes. And then I think really the hope or the takeaway here tonight is, okay, what additional criteria or what kind of lens do you guys have on that criteria that we should be considering as we try to identify those routes moving forward? Again, kind of with the knowledge or always that uh, anchor piece in the background knowing that there's probably going to be some areas we'd like to provide it to that we just um, aren't going to be able to go as, as far to every area um, that we that we may want to. So with that, I'll, I'll let Chase uh, turn it over and you can see we got some team members here that I'm sure are going to contribute at some point too. Great. Thanks, Matt. Um, first, I was kind of hoping that Kristen wasn't going to be here. I told Director Pilcher Hayek and Director Abraham that this was not my best presentation ever that I've done, and now Kristen's here. So I'll be judging it every time. Well, she will, but I also want to say that. So this is my work, not Kristen's, because the charts would be much better had, had she done it. But um, just what's in front of you is what? Okay, is a copy of the presentation that's loaded on board docs. So um, Director Fence, you should be able to access it as well. The additional handouts are just um, larger copies of some of the data that is in the presentation. So when we get to that point, it's easy to having to flip through all of those. And so they're not necessarily separate. But um, as Superintendent Degner said, um, he kind of laid out where we were and where we're going to go. Because leaving the October meeting, the charge from the board was for us to take a more um, holistic look at attendance support busing and see if we couldn't put together a framework that we could analyze these uh, routes every year so it become an annual process. And we started that work. Um, I won't um, bury the lead. Um, what we're going to recommend at the end is that we spend an additional year trying to better analyze uh, this work before we put a process in place. And, and we'll show you why we want to do that. Um, and part of that's because we want you to be part of that conversation as we do it. And so I'll try to go through most of this pretty quickly so we can get to that um, communication piece. And um, the first uh, slide is really just uh, a recap of uh, what our district, oper uh, district transportation options are. We went over this in the fall. You'll see attendance support busing down there in the red. That uh, 1,713 students received uh, attendance support busing. And um, sorry, I got so excited about jumping in. Uh, Matt mentioned a couple of our team members. I want to make sure I point those folks out. Esme Davis is our uh, transportation manager here with us. She's been integral in this work. Laura Daly is sitting there in the front row. She's been part of the team that I'll refer to throughout the evening, as well as Nick, and then Kareem Frank, and Shannon Meyer, who is our coordinator for um, the McKinney-Vento Act. And so that's been our core team. It's really done a lot of the heavy lifting throughout, throughout the year. So if you hear me refer to team, that's who I'm, I'm referencing, and they are most definitely welcome to jump in. So, didn't support busing one of our three transportation options, and we did have some budget considerations. We spent $750,000 about. We actually had it on line item at about 800, I think, originally as a budget reduction. But as Matt mentioned, um, we quickly moved away from that because of the value we believe that this plays for um, our students inside the district. We do not anticipate increasing that amount. Um, for next year. And while we did cover this again, I think it's important to understand some of the history of the attendance support busing. We went through more of that 
um, in the fall, and there's a full report that, that's linked in that you can find as well if you're on the electronic version. And you kind of see the evolution um, of, or of the, the program. The routes that we had in 16, 17, and then they were revisited again in 2019, 2020, and um, for the most part, okay. Um, if we go to the 22-23 school year, they're the same. Um, you saw that those are the routes that, that we'd offered in 2019 uh, are the same ones that we're currently offering. Alexander Boulevard, Hoover, Horn, Man, Southeast, Twain, and Weber. 14 routes supporting those 713 students. And one of the pieces we really focused on in our last conversation were a couple of routes that um, we've characterized as attendance support busing, but actually weren't attendance support busing. It just happened to be how our transportation fell out in the 21-22 school year and our ability to provide an additional route to a neighborhood at Weber and then also a neighborhood at Lincoln. And we have a little bit of that detail there at the bottom. They were not in this group of routes we provided for 22-23, but they've kind of been talked about in that conversation. So we look at 23-24. Uh, we are proposing um, basically the same routes that were in place this year. That goes back to where I started about we think we need to take an additional year to look at how these criteria should shake out. We felt like we were pretty public in our budget discussion about not cutting attendance support busing. So we felt like even at this point, if we kept the same number of routes, but move them around, that might seem as though we were going back on that decision not to, um, not to cut our attendance uh, support busing. Plus, we also uh, know we're making that uh, transition to middle schools in about 15 months that Lucas is leading for us. And with that, we believe there'll be some other changes. And so we feel like this is a good time to take another year and, and to look at that. And so that's a number of the factors that um, have influenced both why the route stayed the same and why we are um, going to take another, another look at this, although they do go a little bit deeper than that. And one reason for that is part of the work that we did this last year was to reanalyze what they did with the 2019 routes. Yes, uh, other direction. Sorry, go forward. That's all right. Um, and the, really the crux of this slide is those factors there in the middle, the factors they consider, the number of students on routes, the distance from the neighborhood, the number of ELL students, the number of Acadia Vento students, age of the students, access to public transportation. And one that we believe that was heavily looked at that wasn't actually listed was a subjective conclusion about the FRL, FRL status of the families in these neighborhoods. It wasn't ever necessarily defined. If you look at that next page, Kim, there is a chart that they actually used in looking at the analysis. And um, you can see those factors that we just talked about across the top. Some are objective. If you look at the number of students, the, the distance uh, potentially from the building the number of students, um, but again, we believe that there was an influence of free and reduced lunch status that isn't reflected in this chart. And the other thing that's not here is that we were never able to identify what the scoring rubric actually was. And so if you look down the total on the right-hand side, they have points, but it was never actually clear what qualified for what number of, of points. And so a lot of subjectivity going into some of those pieces. Um, and so if you look to the next slide, our 22-23 analysis, and you see the, the district team that I referred to earlier. And um, really, the, the identified need is that students within dis designated geographical areas may experience decreased school access without district transportation provided to the students where they reside. And the question that came up was, OK, well, is attendance support busing really about a geographical area, or is it about the characteristics of our students and our families living in that area? Because if, and Kim doesn't have to do it, if you flip back to that slide right before that about that 2019 analysis, there's nothing in there about safety. So there, there's nothing in the equation about 
are there hazards that exist that would make it more difficult for these students to um, get to where they live based on that location? And look, not passing any judgment about whether or not that's the right or wrong approach, just trying to figure out exactly how we're looking at these areas so we can better, as a team, with your feedback, understand what are the influences that we want to look at moving forward, and that's what we're going to kind of get to at the end. But I just wanted to pause and, and point that out. And obviously our goal is to develop criteria and a process that can be annually utilized to establish our routes for the district. They should include objective data points, but we also believe they should include factors that we use in other student-driven processes, like the RAM, like our boundary decisions, so more of those other pieces that we've seen utilized, and also to ensure consistent um, school access for students in those geographical areas. Our initial work led to several um, conclusions and proposed next and one proposed next step. First, as I kind of alluded to, the current criteria, the 2019 criteria, we believe are insufficient to support an annual attendance support busing evaluation process. Um, part of that reason, and these kind of flow from that, is that attendance support busing zones or neighborhoods have not been identified throughout the district. The only ones that have been identified are these ones that either currently have attendance support busing or were originally identified back in 2015. There is no objective pathway for an area that does not currently receive attendance support busing to actually be provided the service. So it, it ends up being kind of a, a squeaky wheel syndrome where other folks come and talk to you all or they talk to their SFA who comes to us and, and tries to make a case for why they should be included. We just, there was never that type of set um, objective way to look at it. The current criteria reflect more of a subjective um, and, re and then reflect the student family characteristics rather than concerns about the geographical area. Again, not saying that's right or wrong, just trying to put out there what we're currently looking at. And um, we still lack significant comparison data. We have some data that we want to share with you this evening, um, but um, there is just isn't a lot. And so because of those factors, we believe that we need to continue to evaluate the program um, and develop an approach that has both objective criteria to start as a starting point and then with the work of the board to give us some of those themes and direction that the superintendent talked about to then allow for a rubric to be developed about how do we score each one of those areas. It's a lot of information. I, just, I know we have an hour, so I'm sure you have lots of discussion and questions. So before we go into the data, questions, comments, or thoughts uh, on what I've shared or what I maybe need to be a little bit more clear on before we move into the data piece. Okay, so the next couple of slides um, are just a little bit of our data intake, and if they're hard to read, that's why you have these two. It's actually all the information just broken into two pieces. And so if you first look at the updated data based on 22-23 school year, <coughs> this one or this first slide, what we did here was we took those routes that had already been established and simply used the same criteria and kind of updated the student data that, that went into there. So the headings across the top will be pretty much the same based on the geographical region, the number of routes, the number of students, um, the number of students on the route, free or reduced lunch, ELL students, homeless with rather than McKinney Vento, and then we tried to tease out what we thought they were trying to do with grade level, of looking at the number of students that were a little bit older, as opposed to those that were a little bit younger. And this helped us in our framework of saying, okay, we've got this, but we're still not sure it, it um, gets us to where we need to go in terms of being able to make a full analysis of the situation. The, the columns in white, or the unshaded columns, those are the routes that currently exist. The ones at the bottom, Coralville Central, Weber, Lincoln, Shimmick. Coralville Central, because it was one of the last ones to be mixed back in 2019. The Weber and Lincoln routes are the ones that we talked about that got busing that was not attendance support busing two years ago. And we added Shimmick because like the Weber route that was just discontinued, the same rationale was originally provided 
absent the idea of the socioeconomic status of those students was that the students on the way to Weber had to walk over 380, right? Yeah, 380. I, I, 80. No, not at Weber. 280. 280. 280. I, I'm just so bad. Um, 218. 218. Perfect. <laughs> 218. Oh, the old 218. All right. We'll eventually get there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so they have to walk somewhere. No, they have to walk over 218. We also have a neighborhood at Shemek that has to walk over what if you go look at. It's probably a much more dangerous crossing over I-80 because of the, of the bridge set up than the one for weather. But it goes to the comparison of what are those other factors that are influencing it. So just giving it for comparison because again, we don't have set <coughs> zones divided for each neighborhood. So we were trying to kind of picking about, okay, what could be a comparable and maybe another school district school in the district? So there's question. not a bus route for Shimmick. It's just a comparable situation to Correct. Weber that you added as a demo. Based on, ge based on geographics. Yes, got it. Okay, okay. based on just geographic. Well, I mean, and we have the, the, the student breakdown, but mainly based on, on that geographical. So that's just to kind of what brought us up to speed. And um, again, we don't think this is the way to go. We believe, well, that's not true. We don't think this is completely the way to go. We believe we need to build in some baseline factors on top of that as we look at it. And some of the more interesting data, again, it's just data. I think it can be read um, a number of different ways, is the attendance uh, support busing attendance data. That's the other, other page that you have. Um, like I said, I think it can be read a couple of different ways. And I believe that it shows some correlation Nothing that would lead us to believe it's causation, um, but there are some themes that we can take out here. So if you look at it, really the way to read it, right, the schools, the unshaded schools are the ones that receive the busing, the other four, uh, the ones that we've included for those various reasons. The attendance support busing attendance. So that's the average attendance for the students that received attendance support busing this, this year. So you see that trending. We also tried to divide up the school attendance zone into several different areas. So the non-attendance support busing walk zone would be the walk zone, so those have been two miles, minus the kiddos that are receiving attendance support busing. So it's everyone but those kids. So for example, you see that it's 84% for Alexander. Um, they have two different routes, that's why it's listed twice and the attendance support busing is 94%. The third column, full zone attendance, means anybody in the walk zone, both if they got the busing or if they didn't have the busing. So it makes sense that that number is between the 94 and the 82 because of the average of that. Okay, so if, I'm, if I lose it. The other complication is Adam is at a conference this week, so. <laughs> He and I had a lengthy data conversation, a couple of them. So if you're confused, ask me because, like I said, I had to pull them out of a session a couple times. Um, the, the column, full school, 2022-23 attendance, obviously the overall, whether they walk or if they have a bus, and they compared a year for the year before for 21-22. And then we went ahead and broke it down into, um, this is just students, it's not a percentage, of the students that live within a one mile radius of the school and students that live inside that two mile radius, that's gonna come back because we started to look at a couple of those breakdowns and how we, how we looked at that. So questions on any of that data piece before we start looking at things a little bit more deeply. I know it's a lot. We're supposed to understand as we're looking at this last sheet that when you're comparing, for example, the first column to the second column, there's, there are a bunch of factors that we're just assuming also exist that, that distinguish one from the other. Meaning, there are, those, two for, those two columns raise questions, right? They, it, there's some apple and orange comparison about why the people in the walk zone get there less than the people in the bus. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard to know. And I think that's part of our point of why yeah. it's too surface level without taking a much deeper dive to really tease some of that out. That's a really good point. And one of them is 
the number of students, right? right? And so just the number of students alone that might be outside that walk zone as opposed to getting the busing could really tip those scales. Um, but yes, this is just us looking at nothing else but knowing who the kids were yep. that were on the bus and not and, and what was their attendance. Great. Um, so yes, correct. That was the, the part. I would, the other thing I would draw attention to because this is the one that did you all did ask us about specifically is if you look at Weber and Lincoln, mm -hmm. the first column they didn't have a bus this mm -hmm. year, right? But we were still able to tease out the students that were in that zone as opposed to students that lived outside of the zone that used to get the attendance support busing, okay? So the non attendance support walk zone for Weber this year, meaning everybody that didn't, who was in the walk zone last year and still didn't have the attendance support busing was 87%. But the full zone was at 90%. Well, what we know, is, and Adam didn't have this readily available for me, is that that means that the actual, the zone that was getting attendance support busing at Weber last year, their attendance percentage this year is actually higher than the rest of the walkers in Weber. And that's again where you have to look at, okay, how many students is it? The other problem is we did it based on a zone. We didn't, we didn't geocode down to the actual students. So we know these families are, are transient. Some of these families in the area are transient. So we can't even tell you that it's the same students that are living in that zone this year that were living in it last year. It's just, we can get there. It's, it's gonna take a lot of time. It's gonna take, it's, it's gonna be a heavy lift to get there. But that's what that shows you. Um, it just so happens that um, Lincoln, the, it's the same. The, the, everybody in the walk zone, whether they were in that attendance support busing zone or not, are coming roughly 94% of the time. Now again, that's a, that was a small group. I think it was only 10, kid, 10 kiddos, right? And so again, that shows the, the, the impact there. But yes, Mary Kate, there are a number of different variables, variables that could be behind here, but this is if we looked at it surface level, we tried to, tried to circle it on some of those things. Lisa. Well, I just, I, I, I was wondering if we could combine these two charts to look at the numbers better, but I don't think we can because, so what I, I'm looking at like the first Alexander row, mm -hmm. and the school one mile radius students at 112, those actually wouldn't be any students receiving attendance support busing because on that first route, according to the other chart, the distance is 1.2 to 1.5 miles. So you're ahead of me. Actually, we did. Oh, I did make a little bit of a. You a just didn't comparison. give us that chart. Well, because I took both pieces okay. and yeah, on the slide. You okay. have it. It's on. It's on the slide. Okay. But yeah, uh, that's a good. That's a good piece to point out as well. Because I'm just uh, to, to just parse the numbers down more. Because I think that your point is well taken. That like, is it a big sample size or small sample size, and that'll affect the the standard deviation of the reliability of the data. Blah blah blah. But. Right. Well, so can move forward two slides, I think. Three, one more. So there's, this is where Kristen's lack of page numbers on these slides are really hurting me. It's so really it is, it's just, it's, it's, it's killing me right now. You probably shouldn't evaluate in public, so I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so, and I don't know, Lisa, this is more what you're talking about. So um, one of the things you're gonna see us suggest is that we should limit attendance support busing to students that live between 1.0 mile and 1.99 mile from the school. We have to be able to maximize our resources and we think that that is a reasonable cutoff. And so what you have on these two slides is the left-hand uh, column or chart shows the number of students that live between 1.0 mile and 1.99 mile from the school. The right-hand chart shows the number of students that are actually on the route and the distance the bus travels. Take Horn, for example. Horn only has six students that actually live more than a mile from their school. 
but because of the geography over there on the west side of the district, going up Benton Street, and where the only entrance to Horn is actually off of Sunset, and you meander back in there, any route gets what? It's an additional 0 0.4, 0 0.5, or maybe even 0.6 of a mile added to it. So there, a lot of the kids that are attend receiving attendance support busing, actually the majority in Horn, live closer than a mile of the building. It's just that rather than walking straight up Benton and going in a gate that is probably non-existent, it's going to be non-existent, but it's there right now, yeah. and going in that gate and that only being a 0.8 or maybe even a 0.7 walk to the school, because of the way the bus zigs and zags, it makes it look like that route's a lot longer. And so how do we look at things like that about, okay, it shows really, right, that Horn has 59 kids on the bus. And according to this, we're making some of them walk 1.9 mile. That's not the reality. I'm only making six of them walk more than a mile, right? Now, there's other places where you have 210 kids at Alexander, and we're providing that transportation to, you know, almost two-thirds of them, about 160, 165. And, and so it goes both ways. And I think that that's why we have to do a, a, a deeper dive on the data and how, how it really shakes out. Because um, on a surface, you can make the data really say whatever you want to say. It's just how are we going to, to, to line it up in a way that we believe can maximize the resources and meet the needs of what we're trying to do with the isn't that funny? I never thought about how we're, it's not as the crow flies, it's how the kid walks. Right. But what a difference. Horn's a perfect example. It's crazy how you get into that parking lot. Yeah. But yeah, that's what we need, right? We need the measurement on foot. And so, and we didn't even do that. Adam just did, basically we put a, you know, a pen in the middle yeah. of the school and he drew a circle and this is one mile and this is two miles. And so, that might not even be as accurate as we want, but yeah, I think Horn is a great example yeah. because you can walk right up Benton Street. The law school people here know that's Benton Street. Yeah, so I mean that's yeah. right. You know, I mean we were we're, we're well familiar. No, but with there's that. also that park, and you can cut through the park. Yeah. But a bus, but a bus, bus can't. Can, and a bus can cut do through it. The park. And a bus yeah. has to that's go also around. gonna right. And there are a few schools like that. I was just yeah. gonna say, I suspect many of our schools because we have the back playground area and a kid could always enter from the back and cut through but a lot of those playgrounds are then abutted by houses and then you've got the street so you're having to go all the way around like I know at Penn they have a little sidewalk I mean, that splits two houses and you can right walk right yeah. in the back yeah several yeah interesting and so then you have Twain where they only have 16 kiddos that live in that 1 to 1.99 mile radius but even their routes are less than um, than a mile and so um, not saying it's again right or wrong but I think it's data points that we need to know and so then as you look at other influencing factors how are we weighting those in a way that if we think the students at Twain should continue to get a bus what priority are we putting on some of those other pieces that, and that's really what the guidance we want from the board is what are those factors that we should consider because um, where are we look slide so, can you go forward one more slide, please? So, what we would like to suggest. Just before yeah, you go, go into that suggestion, just a thought, you know, I guess that I'm sitting here having that I've had before, too, that I think I just want to put in you guys' mind. Just from an overall, like, budget picture, and as we think about expenses, it's a real, I don't know if problematic is too strong a word, but it's a, it is a problematic situation for us to have as many elementary schools as we do and to provide this much additional busing. That is a huge tax on our operational system, right? That we have all of these sites and we're still doing additional transportation beyond, right? Because that should be the value in having multiple sites is that they're walkable and they're close and accessible for people. So those don't jive very well for us from an operational budget standpoint. So nothing to do with that other than just to kind of think about that, knowing we operate that many sites and do this much busing, right? Sorry. I saw our total busing cost Yes. Yep. Sorry, go ahead. That's right. So if you look at the next slide, the 23-24 work group, where we think we want to spend our time is 
again, it's a development of some objective criteria and also some subjective. The one we didn't really talk about, and I actually just kind of um, skipped over it, so I apologize. Um, back at the beginning of the presentation, I, I said that um, we were offering busing this year and next year to Southeast Junior High. You don't see them on this analysis because our first um, offering is one of the objective criteria. We're only going to offer this busing at the elementary level. Wait, say that again. Only at the elementary level. A couple of factors, age of students, and the, the vast majority of our neighborhoods in the city attendance area and west attendance area have a public bus route within a um, reasonable walking distance. Up in North Liberty is a different circumstance because of their lack of public transportation. But um, we know that there's bus routes available, public bus routes available for these students um, that are going to attend Southeast. One of the ongoing conversations Matt and I are having with uh, Jeff Fruin in the city is how do we find a way to allow people to ride the city bus for free, especially students. I know they are exploring some options, and so that's good for the entire city, not just for our students, but that would be tremendous for us on a number of levels, mm -hmm. not for, just for our kiddos, but for our parents as well. Mm -hmm. But, yes. They're going to pilot it. I'm not sure how long they can afford it, and I didn't want to I haven't followed it closely enough to know how much they've shared publicly, so but if yeah. they were sharing it publicly, I just, didn't, okay, I just didn't want to get out too far in front of the city. We also know Better Together yeah. um, is working on that too with, with all the municipalities that are busing. Okay. So there's a lot of push for it. Yeah, I think they'll realize that. I mean, I think that's a achievable for them. It seems like they have the right people in the room for that Better Together conversation to get something like that done, and there's you know, it seems like the willingness and the will to do it, so. But for the difference between, you know, the two mile distance and the three mile, is that an age thing? State code, yeah. But is it by age? So when our sixth graders are in middle school, is it gonna be three miles for the sixth graders? You know what the no, breakdown it's is? two miles for junior high. Oh, it's two, for, oh, still in junior high. Two, two, yeah. okay. It's two for everybody. For two for junior high. It's only three in high school. And elementary, three and high school. then three for three high school. Three high school is the switch. I think we probably did. We probably said secondary. We probably and so JP, that's a good question. I think earlier mm -hmm. said secondary. So yeah, that only goes to the at the high school. So if you look at that, the work group for next year, only offered the elementary or K five buildings because we wouldn't start until twenty four twenty five. Then we would look at it as only being offered for neighborhoods or areas that are between one point and one point nine nine miles for designated schools. The one caveat I would give is that. Um, that doesn't mean that a child under zero circumstances would, would have access to busing if it was less than a mile. Some of our IEPs for our special ed students have busing written to them. Um, some of our McKinney Vinto, not some of them, I mean, they're all, all of our McKinney Vinto children are entitled to busing if it's a barrier to their education. Um, so think of some of our, um, some of the shelters for our families. A lot of those are within a mile um, of the school, but there are circumstances, probably for obvious reasons, that we would want to make sure that we put those students on buses. So just because we wouldn't offer attendance support busing doesn't necessarily mean that if there was a specific need, a child wouldn't qualify for busing, even if they were within one mile of the school. Well, in the IEP situation, we could get paid out of the special, special ed. And uh, McKinney Vento would get paid out of McKinney Vento. Okay. Funds. And those are air in run bands and it doesn't have to be a school bus necessarily. Uh, it doesn't. And um, we can probably be good at some point to come back to the board and talk to you all about um, our students that qualify for McKinney Vento and the ebbs and flows of that and how we've seen it just kind of grow historically year over year, but also how that changes throughout the course of the year um, from the beginning to the to the end of the year. Shannon. Miner's done a tremendous job of helping navigate that along with Laura and Kareem. Um, but we spent a lot of time working on that, JP. We're actually adding another van um, because um, of the need of our students and also it's just safer for a long time. We had contracts with Yellow Cab and um, that's just not great, but we didn't have a lot of other options. And then they actually kind of did us a solid by saying they didn't want to partner with us anymore. And we're like, well, that's a problem, but actually it's a... <laughs> We're okay with that. Um, and so we've had to figure out some additional solutions to meet those, those needs. But um, if that's something the board's interested in, um, we would 
be happy to come and talk about how we're serving these students in a different So um, that's some of the objective criteria we use, but we think the founding, the founding, the foundation, the building blocks is this middle bullet on that page, and this is the heavy lift. We in order for us to really look at this in a way that, that ensures that we are not missing students, we have to we have to subdivide the schools into zones that then we can then compare the data on, and it's not been done. And so, figuring out ways to divide up our walk zones into segments, uh, we have there about 60, but you know we need to get the data more to see what those segments might need to look like to then compare them to make sure that we have our attendance support buses deployed in the right areas is, is gonna take us some substantial time. I mean, just to pull the data for tonight, it took us weeks to, to try to get through it, so we know it's gonna take a heavy lift, which is again why we're asking for the year, because it's gonna take some, not full time, but some significant effort just to draw those, to redraw them, to make sure that you know 60 kids could be span across a geographical distance that just doesn't get done we want to accomplish. <coughs> We're looking at ways that maybe the zones are 30, but one zone is in Twain and one is in Lemmy, but those both zones qualify for attendance support busing so we combine them. So we just think there's a lot deeper levels that we need to go to from that objective lens area, but then really where we would like some feedback is once we have those zones created, based on the one mile radius, and looking at all of them across the, the, the 21 schools, is what criteria does the board want us to utilize and then utilizing the rubric to see which neighborhoods qualify and which ones don't. And that's, we have another about 15 minutes, is where we really like some feedback. What are those factors that you all want us to consider or to take into consideration? I, I can't say sitting here that everyone you tell us will make the list, and I can't tell you that some that that maybe we think of and you don't share with us, we wouldn't add to the list. But that's really, I love to answer questions, but really where we'd like to spend the rest of our time with you is just gaining feedback on what are those, maybe we would say more characteristics of our students, maybe even more so than the terrain of the neighborhood, or maybe it's a combination of both, and I don't mean to shortchange either or to, to um, <clears throat> to be offensive anyway, I was struggling about how to differentiate the characteristics of a geographical region with actually our students that live there. And what we found is a combination of both, and we would just like your help in better identifying the ones that you all would want us to consider. Yeah. I consider myself a pretty smart person. Okay. But this is way beyond me. I, so, so uh, but I think, uh, I was, I'm just thinking about the composition of the ASP work group. And is it possible we get someone from the uh, homeless community who does, who does shelter management, high enough up to understand what the issues? Can we get someone from, uh, from other groups that may have some, have some insight that we don't bring as, a, as people in the district? not to disparage anyone who's working on this now. But uh, and you may have ideas too about who you would like to see included in, in this work. Okay. And how, how long is this work group going to be engaged with this? So, um, and I hope it's gonna take us less than six months so that we can start doing so this in so this it's a matter of months. Right. We have some time to actually but, try to get some out. To give some additional input, right? Yes, for next year. And so, Charlie, I think that um, the, the work group wouldn't necessarily be the group that then would score every neighborhood, Just right? Just developing criteria. Just developing it. And sure. saying, I, I agree. We need it broader than just some of the folks who do it internally. And I'm not saying we don't need some external people right away. But we definitely, when we get to the scoring point, it can't just be five people from Central Office. So we gotta bring in some SFAs, some other folks to help us score those, but we believe we need to give, that was, I think, part of, they were building it as they fly it, and we do that a lot, and we just don't wanna repeat that. So they had a lot of people, 20 or 30 in the room, 
trying to do this work, and it, and it, it just got a little bit muddy. So we want to be able to provide them a framework, a scoring system, and say, okay, now you all, out in the schools, around these neighborhoods, you tell us, based on these criteria, how, how these shake out. But I think we can, so. Well, I'm just thinking, I would like not to have eight months from now sitting up there, I'll probably up there or not, but um, <laughs> having three or four or five parents come and say, why isn't my kid qualified for grade this money? And, and they make a case which, to me, at the moment, sounds great. Well, I think that's the important part of this, of this project is to have criteria so that even if parents do, and there always will be parents, that we will say because we follow the rules. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really great that we're going to do this. We have to have criteria that we're following every time. Huge project, totally going to be worth it. Um, for me, I lean more toward the geography than I do the demographic. Okay. Um, I've had three kids in three elementaries. So, you know, I, I can think about, for example, what was hard as a parent to send the little ones, right? In three different elementary schools. So I think um, that the crossing of the, of the big streets, we didn't have that. But if we did, I would have been real nervous about it. And then the other thing is um, the way we mitigate some of that is by having our crossing guards where they are. And that makes all the difference. So, so I think that comes into play too, right? It's literally looking at what that walk looks like and it means for example if you go to new hoover you have to go to where the crossing road is to cross safely that's the deal like if you cross anywhere else on that road it's dangerous that comes into play we were you know we say this is not again it's not as the crow flies but it says the kid walks there have to be rules about how the kid walks too we provide the um, guided route and that's how we mitigate some safety concerns but safety concerns, although they are, what's the word I'm looking for? A deferential, that's a different word. Although they can be, what? Did you say describe? describe. It's like, uh, it's um, safety. Subjective. Subjective, thank you. Um, you know, I do think there's some ways to make it objective for the purposes of this project. One of the things that I just thought of hearing you speak is, you know, we've received some complaints this year about crossing guards not being consistently at those high touch intersections and if there's a way to include that in the criteria because I think that's you know if you have a crossing it does make all the difference in safety and adult and I know my understanding is the city's responsible for providing those crossing guards and so if we have a consistent problem where the city isn't providing a crossing guard where we know that it needs to have a crossing guard that to me makes it rank higher on the unsafe metric. I guess if that makes sense. But I don't know if that's easy to measure, but it just Where I, I don't know if the I don't know if the school I, I suspect maybe the school would have a good sense of I don't think what's that, going on. I mean that that's just gonna that would be hard because it's gonna change by employee potentially, yeah. right? And so it's really about if there's a crossing guard or not, I think is what we'd have to measure. That. Now the reliability of that crossing guard show up on a consistent basis that could be different this month than it was last month, right? And so that's going to be pretty hard to factor in. But I mean, for me, one of the um, criteria that I know is one of the ones we look at already, and I want to make sure it stays on there, um, is income level or income opportunities. Um, because knowing, I was, I walked with the group from Weber from over, uh, I think it was Shady Glen. Shady Glen, yeah. 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 And um, we serve a high population of families that, while I was waiting for them to <laughs> gather to walk, parents were struggling trying to get to work because mm -hmm. they, they needed to be somewhere for work and can't see second graders off to walk, so they depended on other kids. And I'm like, this is insane. And doing that walk, we almost got run over because it was also a high traffic area that people were just flying by. So um, that that has to be a priority. And I I would note that it's not a current pass criteria, not an official one. Oh. So 
I think I think that's why it's important to make it official. official. And and I'd be interested the pass criteria distance from neighborhood to school. Uh, doing that more sophisticated analysis of walking distance to school and busing distance to school so that we have that that that's scored separate differently okay. than the busing distance. To Rathina's point, you know, my school when we got redistricted when Hoover closed, my neighborhood was the farthest from Horseman. And I remember Brian Kirschling coming to me and saying, Don't get pissed, but your school, your neighborhood's going to be the farthest from Horace Mann. I was like, my neighborhood is, um, it, it doesn't have low income boundaries. So we could make it work. We could carpool with each other. We could figure it out. So that, that kind of reinforces what Rosina just said. That I think we can acknowledge that there are greater challenges if you're strapped for getting everybody out of the house at a certain time and don't have a neighbor that might be able to help you out because they're also strapped getting out of the house at the same time. I did see that as, I do think that that is an important factor too. Yeah, I think those two together rise to the top for me. Just the, you know, I'm, I mean, one, you know, often in reality that is a, um, more often um, is that folks with incomes are more often closer together. Apartment complexes, for example, you know, so it's a little easier to serve with a bus. You know, we have folks who live in a denser area. But then safety too, and I know we're secondary is not on this list, but in my head is always Highway Six and crossing Highway Six. I wish you know I always want Highway Six to build oh pedestrian overpasses over Highway Six at some key points because um, that's but that's Southeast kids and City High kids. I mean that's not cool. That's a hike over Highway Six and it's not safe. And that's something that we're willing to put back on the table if the board wants us to pound it. Same as JP, but like it's just. With such a limited number of resources, we just kind of looked at it as a team and we're like, okay, if we have to draw a line between making a kindergartner or an eighth grader, yep. we're going to have to decide with and getting you, a bus. You can't take the city bus, right? It takes yeah. you an hour because yeah. it doesn't go directly from, you have to go downtown first. Right. And then you got to catch the bus. But, I mean, I rode that bus and it was 6.45. And, it, you know, quite a few, lots of kids did that. You know? And that's, you know, I mean, I, I, we're not going to solve all of the problems, but I do think prioritizing. Um, the folks who are going to have the biggest barriers to getting there, both safety and you know, folks like you described, it's a struggle to get your kids home. You know. But this goes to a point that Mary Kate made earlier: is that if we develop some set criteria that we use annually, and there comes a time when we think that we need to reinstate secondary, all we have to do is say we're getting rid of the age category, and then we slide the secondary rates in, routes in. And we judge them against the exact same established criteria. We don't have to start over to look at it differently. Are there any, has anybody done, I'm sure people have done this, but like walkability studies? Because, you know, identifying things like, oh, there's that path through the park that we might not pick up on a traffic study. The city the city, the city, the city does. Say somebody's got that data. Right? I, I kind of wrote, I thought that's what, when you said that they did this on walking, that was what I went to, is I think the city must have a. a yeah, they just did it recently. I mean, they had a big yeah. conference city by city. Did it. Within the last two or three weeks. But you can also find any cross country coach with the distance wheel yeah. and grab the distance wheel and just walk the route mm -hmm. and figure also, out the distance. All of your apps have walking. Yeah. yeah. Too. yeah. I guess that's a more high tech way to do it. <laughs> and the wheel. I, I will I want to know one thing I'm a little concerned with, and it's on this slide before this, but the number of available routes will be based on annual program budget. Mm -hmm. It's I understand we're in a budget, and if this is the way it has to be, it has to be. It's just, you know, if we get into the situation where there's five routes that are all scored the same, and we only have money for one route, like, how do we make that decision? I mean, so, again, I'm a little nervous with that constraint on how we're going to move forward. Because if we really do put all this time into developing this objective, subjective criteria, and those kids all score as needing attendance support busing. I don't know how we just I'd like draw a name from a hat and say, well, you guys are the ones that get it and the other ones don't. Hopefully there's no tie. And hopefully there's yeah. no tie, right? In a perfect <laughs> world, that's that's <laughs> what happens. Real, but not that's... giving us the flexibility to... to well, we can also just, we don't have, like we'll just take the money from somewhere else. I mean, we, 
I would I would wonder if that's what we would do, but with when it just says the number of available routes are based on a budget, I wonder if, I mean, if we're prohibiting well, I mean, it. We had to cap it somehow. I know, I know, I know. Well, and I think from a budget standpoint, what you guys would want to do is consider you'd want to be able to see the whole budget before you'd make a decision in isolation to commit additional dollars around attendance support busing, right? Because you'd want to see how the puzzle's affected. So uh, we'd want to know that, okay, we've currently allocated $750,000 for attendance support busing. If now all of a sudden you want to count a million dollars, well, where's that going to come from? Like JP saying, like, what are, because it's at what cost, right? We know the resources aren't increasing. Yeah. So then where's, where is that going to pull from and what does it come from? And that may be compelling that you'd say, yep, we want to do a million dollars and we want to found it. You may say, nope, we can't do it without that. We've got to leave it at 750000 So I think that would be the part of the conversation you'd get to. What about, I, and I know we have to close this down, but what about when we talked about this before? I think you two were talking about it. How would you compare not providing it to providing it in some of these places? Is that what we're doing as well? We're still going to we're still going to try to pull that data, and I, th I think that that's you know, the, the only piece of data we can try to tease out so far is that data that shows that the students that were in the former walks, the former attendance support busing zone at Weber, are going to school at a higher rate than the kids in the rest of the zone. But that's not the same thing. I oh, that's I'm what sorry. Lisa, remember, you brought this yeah, up. Yeah, no, and it's missing on this chart. Okay, well, I agree with you. Okay, I must. Like I thought you were talking about comparing Lincoln's, attendance patterns. Last year, Lincoln's ASB attendance rate, right. the 21-22 rate, compared, compared yes. to this year's 22-23 yeah. rate, you're right. that's, that's what we're interested yes, in seeing. That's, yes, you're, you're right. That's just one Only because we're trying to figure out how to be as efficient as possible, because we have to. So there might be people that don't get into a zone anymore based on our new criteria, and that's something we all have to really realize is is a good part of this process. It, it's an important data point. We just weren't able to sure. tease it, but it's still on our list. Great. So I know, so can I, just a couple of quick things. Right? Molly, so you wanna, the, oh, you've I'm sorry. been very quiet, and you haven't no. said anything. No. I just no. want to make sure because we're finding out. Yes, thank you. So, well, I, I talked way too much, but I, I've, I've taken <laughs> some notes, and I, I, the good news is that we're having the same thought process as you all. The couple that we didn't get to that were on the list, um, ELL status, that's something that was yes. compared, is that something the board wants us to yes. continue? The number of ELL students, okay, I figured as much. And then the number of homeless students yes. was yes. also, yes. okay. Did anybody have any problems with the past no. criteria staying on the list? I don't think we had any list. problem with the past criteria, yeah. okay. so you could use that and then factor in some of the new things you heard tonight. Is that easier? Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, we just felt like there wasn't, it's really that there's no foundation of how we define these areas right. or how you move a little bit. Right? how you move it in, so. Why is ELL on there? I, I, I don't know what the, how, what's the connection? Not all of our buildings offered ELL before, and so we were busing students from one attendance zone to the other attendance zone. So that's, a, are we that's, doing that now though? No, because oh, all of our well, elementaries have say, ELL. So I don't understand, if we're, if we're contemplating income, um, that seems to be the primary thing that we were considering there is there something I'm missing about ELL? There is. I mean, yeah. it's a we would consider it a compounding factor if you don't speak English in the home, and so it makes it more difficult to be able to navigate, navigate just navigate public transportation or the resources that are available. That's what we hear from our SFAs and from our ELL mm -hmm. staff, and, and especially when you say when you layer the ELL status onto the low income status, mm -hmm. and so it's a they're compounding factors is how we refer to them. Um, and so that's why it's been kept included, but I think it's a, it's you know, it's a valid question. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we have an, and this won't be the last time we visit, I assume. So we'll. Does it make I'll, sense I'll, to still split out fourth grade below? That's what I did make that note. No, yeah. I crossed it out because if the board is okay with us first looking at it just for elementary, <laughs> we'll get rid of that that age yes. separation. There. Okay. All right. I think you have some good direction, oh, I hope I, so, from no the board. Work, no Any work. last comments from anyone on the board? All right, the last thing is the next operations committee, and uh, I am going to report without an emotion attached to that, that we take the summer off for our ops committee. So we have no operations committee in June or July, and we will pick back up in August. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn the meeting? Uh, so moved. Second.
All in favor? Aye.